Hello and welcome to another episode of Heal Thyself, Benefits of Holistic Living. I'm Mia Signs, your host, and with me in this episode is Asher Fox. Now, Asher has this remarkable story of weight loss and um, helping people through exercise and food, but he's going to tell more of his story because it's pretty remarkable. When I saw his book, I was like, oh, we got to have him on. So welcome, Asher. Oh, great. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. It's awesome to have you. Now, you're one of those people, and, and I was too. I've gained a little bit back, but um, you're one of those people, and I'm working now on the other on the reverse side again, but you're one of those people who have lost a lot of weight. I lost 140. You lost mm-hmm. 120. Mm-hmm. So what made you, I mean, I want to hear your story, but I also want to ask you, and you'll probably cover it, what um, first made you gain the weight, because mine was intentional to keep men away, I didn't have uh-huh. support, and then when it was killing me, I saved my life and I lost it. So, what made you gain it, and then what made you lose it? Well, ultimately, at the heart of the, my book, Fact of Fearless, is the understanding that the subconscious mind works to prove itself right, and it especially does that as far as core beliefs go. So, I had core beliefs from childhood of not being good enough, of being second best, of uh, being unlovable, these types of things that, that came from childhood. So being overweight was the way that my subconscious you know, manifested it. And, and we, you know, the subconscious tends to pick the path of least resistance. So food was really that for me in my home because you know, my parents were overweight and they came from a generation where there wasn't you know, healthy eating, hadn't really been, and diets hadn't even been talked about yet. So you know, there was all types of food, really unhealthy food around. So that was an easy choice for me to make to subconsciously to, to satisfy those beliefs. Mm-hmm. Very and, interesting. And then as far as losing it, you know, basically I got really, really tired of being really unhappy. And I thought that I was unhappy because I was overweight. But, you know, if you read the book, you begin to understand you're actually overweight because you're unhappy. Mm-hmm. So that kind of led me on the path to, you know, eventually turning away from the physical modalities and realizing I need to really take a journey in and look at my own subconscious mind and my own mind and my own heart and heal that which you know, is what brought me to working, doing this for 18 years and helping other people do the same. Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome work. Self-discovery is a majorly fun journey besides really, uh-huh. impor- really important to save our lives. Yeah, it, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's definitely a process that we all go through. And, you know, the exciting part is when you reach the point where it really is a fun process. You know, you're excited to, yeah. to kind of begin these things. You know, in the beginning it can be, you know, a little daunting because most of these neuroses, like, you know, using food to self-soothe is a, is a you know, like Carl Jung said, all suffering is a substitute, or all neurosis is a substitute for legitimate suffering. So these things are to avoid self-discovery and working on those things. But once you start, you know, the fear of it is never as bad as the actual going through the process, and then you start to get the positive payoffs. Exactly. What I love about it is it's so remarkable because most of society is still under a veil and is afraid to look and see what what is out there further so oh absolutely and i think that you know there's so much education you know at least as far as a subconscious behaviorist and a clinical hypnotherapist it amazes me how really poorly educated the general population is about the power of the subconscious mind it's more than 90 percent of our functioning you know Mm -hmm. so much comes from that and really you know most people still think that they're that five to ten percent of the conscious mind, and that's who they are. And you know, if people knew, well, I think we're better educated and more aware of the tools that were out there to change, more people would be willing to do it. Okay, since you brought it up, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you to explain then. Okay. Um, explain for those who are um, beginning this path of it's also a spiritual path besides a self discovery, or it's a hand in hand type of a path. And everything that involves the self is a spiritual discovery. Yeah, so. it is. Um, I'm just trying to uh, not throw some people off who are watching. So uh, would you share with them the difference between subconscious and conscious? Sure. The, the subconscious mind, well, it's easier to start with the conscious mind, I guess. You know, the conscious is basically who we think we are, our conscious thoughts, what we're aware of, you know, the things that we can remember, you know, the the de- decisions that we choose to make throughout the day. The subconscious is over 90% of our functioning. It's where all of our core beliefs you know, originate from, beliefs we may not even be aware of. Mm-hmm. Our emotions come from the subconscious. Our habits come from the subconscious. Uh, all of our memories, things that influence us that we don't even consciously remember, 
are from our subconscious. You know, so all of this stuff is is there. So when you you know you see people that self sabotage or you know their, whether it be their relationship or the weight loss or what have you, and they're just completely unaware that they're doing it. You know, it's from their subconscious. And a lot of times the people outside can look and see, oh, he or she is doing the same pattern again. But they can't see it because they're basically running a, a subconscious script. So ultimately all change really requires working with that, that 90 plus percent of the subconscious mind that's going to stick and last. That's awesome. Now, what tools did you first bring up for yourself to, it had to be self-love tools, uh -huh. So, somewhat. So let's talk a little bit about what it took for you to lose this 300, well, you were 300 pounds, to lose this weight. And also at the same time then segue into as a, um, as a healthcare provider as far as, did you have a, um, a gym? I did. I was actually, I was a, uh, we have a, a visitor. <laughs> Yay, we love visitors. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll let them stick around. <laughs> um, the, uh, I was a certified personal trainer. I own three personal training certification companies. He, he likes to be the star. His name is Trouble, by the way. Oh, um, and, and everybody's going to really love you now. <laughs> yes. Um, he, uh, or I, he, I owned uh, personal training studios, three in Tallahassee. I you know, would work with people, but I really wasn't able to solve my own weight issues. So, and I saw this in my clients too, that as soon as I stopped holding their hand, they would begin to gain weight again. So I knew it was really an issue at, at a subconscious level that, you know, emotional level that needed to be resolved. You know, I started with basic cognitive behavioral therapy. And, you know, that was, uh, you know, certainly a good place to start, but it was also somewhat slow when I knew that there was other more powerful processes you know, I, I had always studied NLP, so I began to, um, to, you know, really kind of turn to that. But I also, you know, realized that all of these modalities, whether it was NLP or hypnotherapy or whatever, all of the gurus would say, you know, this is it. This is the one thing that can solve all of your problems. And I found that, you know, all of these things had a piece, you know, for somebody, mm -hmm. for whatever issue they were dealing with. So over the years, you know, I, I became... Uh, certified in, an educator in hypnotherapy, clinical hypnotherapy, uh, NLP, emotional freedom technique, you know, some cognitive behavioral work, coaching. And so it was really kind of a combination of all of those things and a lot of trial and error. You know, a lot of it was, you know, if we're in enough pain and we're turning within, even if we don't necessarily have a guide or the tools, you know, this, the, there's a self-healing component too. You know, so, you know, if you're willing and brave enough to look within, you know, even without help, you know, you can kind of begin to heal yourself to a degree if you just kind of follow your own intuition. But that was a process that took me years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically the, the book and the program has been the culmination of all the work I did on myself and the work I've done with clients kind of condensed. So, so they don't have to go through all the years that I went through of suffering from this. Although, to be honest, the, the people that are attracted to this program have already done that. You know, they've been suffering for 10, 20, 30 years with weight issues. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And, and I have to tell you, your, your cat is amazing. He is, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. He, he, uh, <laughs> Does he steal uh, the show all the time? <laughs> you know, this is, I normally, I, I apparently didn't have the door uh, locked. Oh, that's uh, right. It's open now. Because he, he decided to open the door and come in. Yeah, it's I, I sit outside in the evenings and, um, you know, we'll read some. And I don't know how he does it, but he actually jiggles the door handle. I, I've yet to figure it out. So Brilliant. <laughs> yes. He's a very intelligent cat. And he's just so, I'm, I'm sorry, everyone. This, I just love it. It's very, very sweet. He's, he's very subdued. <laughs> there's, another one, there's another one, too, around here. This, this, uh, but uh, she's a little more shy. Okay. So she won't come and sit on your head this time. No, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. She she may jump up in, in my lap, but we'll see. Oh. Not that I'm like the old cat man. You know, <laughs> I'm an older cat man. It, it's it's an interesting set of circumstances how these cats came to be here. But. You know, all healers though, all healers of every kind, they have to have cats because so, there's such an amazing um, heart-based energy from cats that people don't generally realize. They're fantastic creatures. They're incredibly similar to humans in many aspects. I mean, well, I, I had never thought of myself as a cat person, and as I, 
I ended up, my mom needed to get rid of a, of a cat because she couldn't have, have the cat where she was moving. So I took her. And then I thought, well, you know, she's going to be lonely when I'm seeing clients, so I'll get her uh, uh, brother. Yeah. And, um, you know, they really have turned out to be amazing pets and, and yeah. much different than I ever imagined them to be. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, that's awesome that you opened up for that. That's beautiful. Let's talk about, where is this question that I want to talk about? Um, what are the three systems that subvert our effects to change? Well, basically, you know, we have these core beliefs quite frequently from childhood of I'm unlovable or I'm not good enough or I'm going to be alone or whatever the case may be. And, you know, the, a lot of, obviously, the definition of something that's unconscious is we're not consciously aware of it. So a lot of times we're not aware of that. And one of the reasons, even when bringing it to awareness, is that it can be so difficult to change is our subconscious is set up to keep us basically running the same way we always have. Because it essentially, our brain's developed as a survival tool. So if we are still alive right now, you know, whatever we've done up to this point has worked. So the brain is, it doesn't care if you're happy, it cares about survival. So it's invested and it evolved to keep you as you are. So those three tools are one, what's called the, the critical gateway of the mind, which, you know, there's that conscious and then there's that, that subconscious. And there's a filtering mechanism that's that critical factor, critical gateway. And basically what it does is, is it evaluates incoming information and determines what goes into your subconscious. And it only lets information in that's consistent with what you already believe. So, you know, a great example of this is if, you know, you have that friend, we'll, we'll, we'll call her Debbie Downer, you know, no offense to any Debbies. I, I know there's plenty of Debbie, Debbie happiers out there too. But... You know, 10 people can come along and say, Debbie, you're awesome. Debbie, you're amazing. Debbie, you're beautiful. De you know, and it just bounces right off. You know, it's like she might perk up for a minute, but then that voice in her head will say, oh, they're just telling me that because, you know, they think that I'm, you know, a loser or whatever voice is there. Mm -hmm. And basically it hits that critical factor and, and that critical gateway and the critical gateway says, hey, subconscious, this person said we're awesome. Do we believe that? No, we believe that we're, you know, a loser. So it bounces right off. But if one person comes along and says one thing that is negative and, you know, Debbie, you know, your work's not so great today. And the critical factor says, hey, yeah, this is consistent with what we believe. So it lets it through. So the, that critical gateway is one that in the Fact of Fitness program we work at pushing that aside so new programming, new information, new beliefs can go into the subconscious. Secondly is that inner critic, that voice inside that says, oh, you're a loser, you know, you've tried this before, it's not going to work, you know, nothing ever works out for you. That voice, you know, produces a lot of negative emotions that we cause us to overeat, as well as do a lot of other destructive things and just impacts our self-esteem in general. So that voice needs to be transformed. And then the last is the, the RAS, or the reticular activating system which is essentially kind of a biological component of the, the critical gateway. It's part of the brainstem, and it, did, it does a lot of things, actually, sleep regulation quite a bit. But the area that we're interested in is out of the millions of bits of information that are coming into the, through the senses, the conscious mind can only process 20 bits. So it's one of the things that determines what goes to conscious awareness. And it brings to conscious awareness those things that support us and what we already believe. So that kind of has to be reprogrammed. So with those three things working against you, if you don't know how to change and switch that up, it's very hard to change that, that subconscious. Mm -hmm. So if only 20% go to conscious awareness, does the 80% go to the subconscious? Right, and it's actually not even percent. It's bits of information. Oh, that, so it's, sorry, that's right, you did say it, that. If we could take 20%, that would be amazing. Yeah, it it yeah. basically all goes into the subconscious. And that's what, why people don't, again, realize how powerful the subconscious is. You know, I could be sitting here having an interview with you, and over here, there's a window over here. Mm -hmm. I could see my neighbor do something um, out of the corner of my eye that's, I don't know, weird or inappropriate. And I don't even notice it but my subconscious does. And for mm -hmm. some reason, I just don't trust this person anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that I've seen this, you know? So that's information that's coming in through my senses that doesn't even reach conscious awareness. But a lot of it is things like we tend to notice the things that we are looking for, and we look for what we believe. If you've ever been looking at getting a particular car, and all of a sudden, you know, you start noticing them everywhere. That's because mm -hmm. that particular act, they were always there. Yeah. Our reticular activating system says, okay, let's look out for this. Yeah. But if we believe that, you know, we're not good enough or what, what have you, it's always scanning for that information. So we got to change and reprogram that. 
That's I love that you brought up that thing about the car because we've all we've all recognized that when we get a new car or something, it's like, oh my goodness, I had no idea how many people had X, Y, and Z. It's crazy. And they were there all along. Exactly. And which blows me away. I bought a new Camaro last year because, you know, it was my childhood dream car and all the boys had it. And, you know, I'm like, no, I'm doing this all on my own. This is so cool. You know, all this kind of stuff. And then I get it and I see like black ones and yellow ones. And, you know, mine's a, a brick one. But th the point is, is that they're all over. And I thought I was so unique, you know. Yeah, it's, it's amazing all of these things that we don't realize about how the mind works and you know you know that's kind of a great example of seeing you know practically how that works but what we don't realize is that if we have negative beliefs or low self-esteem we're noticing the things that you know are consistent with that so we may walk into the mall and this person over here kind of looks at us and grimaces a little and turns away we notice that yet you know over here, there was somebody, you know, doing something uh, weird. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, or there was somebody over here smiling at us and winking mm -hmm. and saying, "Hey, yes. how you, you know, yeah. we don't even notice that, but we yeah. notice the person over here because this is consistent yeah. with what we believe." And you know, and all these things are, you know, make it hard to change unless you really get in there and understand how to change it. Exactly. I deal with that with my clients, you know, and boosting their confidence level, but actually teaching them that they're not really talking about you. You know, yeah. it's really, it's really amazing how then they let's just talk about this for a little bit then when they realize because this is all part of self-love too when they shift their consciousness on what they once thought was true about say at the gym somebody laughing at them because they're laughing with their friend and there's nobody else in the gym but they're looking towards you because that's where the machines are so you get this built up where i mean this is a true story with one of my clients she was just so freaked out about these people laughing at her and you know, we worked on it and I told her, they're not laughing at you. What about the possibility that they were just having a great time and they're facing you? And I said, within a certain amount of time, when you expand your consciousness, you're going to realize everybody is there to love you. And men started opening doors for her. I mean, it was it was really brilliant. So it's that same process. Yeah, it's, on, it's, it's a cognitive distortion. It's mm -hmm. personalization. We tend to think exactly. everything is about us. And if we have negative self-esteem, you know, we notice that. And even, you know, when in those instances, which are really more rare than we think when someone is, you know, talking about us or whatever the case may be. It's never really us, you know, it's a projection of their own issue or their idea of who we think, you know, they, they think we are. Yeah. You know, doing, doing this as I've done in the past year, for me personally, it's really been a, a wake up call because we're not a wake up call, but, you know, a great example of this because, you know, when you're doing a lot of media work and stuff, you'll get emails from, people and people contacting you that have never met you, you know, and some of the, you know, and, and 99 out of 100 are great, and then you'll get one that's just kind of like, oh, that's a little weird, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, it's just been a great, you know, thing of, this really has nothing to do with me, you know, at all, this exactly. person doesn't even know me, so even when it is, it's never really us, it's their idea of us, which is, exists within their own mind. Mm -hmm. Exactly, awesome, all right, so let's now go into... Uh, how we lure these systems into supporting us in our campaign to regain control over our lives. Everything about this conversation with you is like very, um, we're talking to the professor here. <laughs> uh, I'm an educator about this stuff for a long time. So. Well, it's awesome. So, do I need to repeat the question? No. Um, I, was... I threw you off with the compliment. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, I think it was how to kind of lure those systems. Yes, into supporting us. Well, a lot of it is just basically understanding how the subconscious mind works, you know, and the subconscious mind is basically influenced by you know, what we can simplify and say emotion and repetition. So, you know, a lot of the processes in fact fearless are about uncovering what your core beliefs are first, you know, which are things like, you know, I'm unlovable or I'm not good enough or I'm going to be alone or all men cheat or whatever the case may be. And people consciously, you know, they don't want to acknowledge that. They don't want to look in the mirror and say, oh, yeah, I, I don't believe I deserve love. And so they won't, you know, and those are all those defense mechanisms of, you know, projection and denial and, you know, splitting and all that type of stuff. But ultimately, what we have to do is look at our lives and whatever's going on in our lives is what's inside us. So if we're living a life where we're not feeling loved or we're not getting that love, then that's something that's originated with originating within us. So once we uncover what those beliefs are 
you know, in the book and in the program, there's a lot of processes. You know, there's hypnotherapy CDs and certainly things like that. But a lot of it is really a lot of inner child work, which is that part of yourself that, you know, the inner child, if we look at kind of the traditional, you know, model, so to speak, is that us that we were when we first came into the world before we ever got any idea that we were anything less than perfect. And that child has become wounded, and, and that child is the one that's reaching for food. And, you know, it's a lot of work with learning how to communicate with that child at the conscious and subconscious level and transform it, and realizing that every time that you're, you know, reach for food to feel better, you know, one of the things that really helps people is when they actually externalize this child and they imagine it as a real living child. Could you imagine having your child and, you know, every time the child wanted something, you grabbed a cupcake and shoved it in its mouth and put it in the closet, you know, and that's what we do every time we have a feeling or an emotion that, that upset that originates with that inner child and we give it food to keep quiet, you know, as opposed to what we do with a real child. We would listen to it. We would love it. We would nurture it. We would help it to understand that these beliefs that's causing it pain and suffering, that it's anything less than perfect, you know, it is fallacies and we would help to, to allow that child to transform and feel, feel loved. And those processes are really the ones that kind of lure those, fence, those defenses aside is ones that really, you know, work at that subconscious level, use a lot of emotion and repetition and, and communicate with that inner child. I'm smiling so much because I work with people on the inner child. I don't know if you knew that I was a self-love transformational uh -huh. coach. So I'm loving this because you're absolutely, you're probably one of the most right on people that I've spoken to who deals with self-love and stuff um, regarding similar information because everybody, mm -hmm. you know, there's people who buy their, you know, their clients or other clients buy dollies and things like that. But when we go inside into a, uh -huh. a hypnosis type of or a med deep meditation process is how we shift and change that. I love yeah. that. Let's talk about um, why hypnosis is so important. I mean, we just sort of were covering the effects of, of the shift and the changes, but there's also the um, medical and clinical and um, reasons why. And, and, you know, hypnosis basically, it's, first of all, a lot of people have the wrong idea about what hypnosis is. All they know about it is what they've seen on TV, and, and you know, that is mostly all fiction. You know, hypnosis isn't mind control, can't really make you do anything against your will. You're very aware <laughs> of everything that's going on the whole time. And it's basically just a means, again, for us to very quickly access the subconscious. And a lot of hypnosis is kind of putting you in hypnosis, what, you know, the, the basic level and saying, okay, you're going to be different. You know, you're going to eat healthy now. But that only works for a very short period of time. You know, real good clinical hypnotherapy by somebody with the right training is going to go inside and actually allow these parts to dialogue and transform, allow you to communicate with that inner child. And, you know, hypnotherapy is definitely one way of doing that. But, you know, there are a lot of other processes processes too. Anything that gets us out of our mind and turns us within, you know, is able to do that. But hypnotherapy is definitely one of the more powerful tools. Uh, you know, and I've I use that a lot, obviously. You know, over the years my use of it has transformed. I do also love conversational hypnotherapy now much more so than ever before and have managed to do much more rapid work. But it's definitely a powerful tool in, in reaching the subconscious and definitely part of the Fat and Fearless program. I love that. Of course I would. Can you share, would you like to share with us your free gift? Sure, absolutely. I'm offering a, a free Stop Craving Toolkit, which is basically a uh, series of training videos, three videos that, that they'll get in their email that will actually teach them some different techniques that they can use to stop cravings, kind of understand what cravings are, where they come from. You know, so even though cravings are kind of a symptom level thing, you know, we really, until we resolve the underlying issue, it's still great to treat the symptoms. You know, so if uh, if you have a headache, you know, even if there's something deeper, you still want the headache to go away. So this this will give people some tools to, to do that, and um, they can go to uh, cravingstoolkit.com uh, and uh, get that, and then just sign sign in there with their email, and then the following day they'll start getting the three different emails with the videos and all those tools with them. Awesome, wonderful, thank you. Um, can you talk about? Um, how the pain pleasure balance is critical to getting to and sustain and sub I can't even talk and getting to a healthy weight. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Well, you know, pain and pleasure are at least as far as our physical reality here goes, uh, the two most powerful motivating forces. There's a move away from pain and move towards pleasure. 
subconsciously, we're wired, our subconscious always moves away from pain first and towards pleasure secondly. And the reason for that is it's evolutionary in nature. You know, basically, if you were a caveman several thousand years ago, I don't, I don't know how many thousand years ago cavemen were around, but, ten. you know, you were 10, 10,000 years ago, 10,732 years ago, you're a caveman, and, and you're, you're, you haven't eaten in days, you see this piece of fruit that's there, and you know, wow, this is great, this is the best piece of fruit ever, but then all of a sudden you hear a rustling in the back, and you see a tiger, you got to deal with the pain, potential pain, the negative, before you can deal with the positive, you know, or you're going to get eaten before you get a chance to eat. So over the years, that's evolved to basically be anything that's generalized to negative emotion, anything like that. So we're wired to deal with the negative first, you know, which is, you know, we can see how that translates in a lot of areas of our life. So when a lot of people begin weight loss, that, you know, there's a lot of things that have driven them to be overweight. You know, those beliefs we talk about, secondary gains, which is one of the things that you mentioned when you said um, that weight was a way, I believe you said, of keeping yourself away from men. Well, you know, that was a secondary gain of benefit that you got out of it. But there comes a point where the pain level overrides that, at least in the short term, and people begin to diet. Sometimes it's, you know, they put on their their fat clothes and they can't even fit into those. Or, you know, I caught myself from this angle when I got out of the mirror, you know, out of the bathroom, uh, you know, shower, and, oh, that really, you know, got to change that. Or significant other had a new attractive coworker that started to, uh, you know, at, at the office. Something triggered it. So they begin to die. Well, the challenge is, is that their, their motivation is linked to pain, and their pain is linked to weight. So as their weight decreases, the pain increases, and their motivation decreases. So as they move along, there comes a point where that pain and motivation becomes less than the driving factors that kept them overweight to begin with, belief systems, secondary gains, whatever. And so then they immediately begin regaining the weight, which is why a lot of medical doctors who work with weight loss will say, I don't understand. It's the people that are the most successful. They're, they get halfway there, and then you know they, they go back. And that's, that's part of what happens. So the key to that, and these are a lot of the processes in the book that people will go through, is you've got to, first of all, there's all those belief systems in you know, the secondary gains, which will get you farther. But then you also have to really develop a very well-formed sense of the pleasure of why you're doing this, you know, the payoff of what it's going to be like to lose weight, of living that particular type of life. And people think that they have that. They think, oh, uh, I'll be able to go to the bathing suit and feel good. But at a subconscious level, what there really is, I'll go there and not feel bad. It's the avoidance pain. So you got to install that subconscious level that pulls towards pleasure too. Thank you. I want You're you welcome. to talk a little bit about cravings. Sure. Well, you know, cravings have, you know, they're a symptom and they, you know, like everything else are kind of driven by all that other stuff. You know, cravings are basically a tool that we have, you know, or that the subconscious has to kind of, again, fulfill those negative beliefs. But cravings can have a, a lot of different take a lot of different shapes. One, there certainly is the physical aspect of cravings that deal specifically with the subconscious. So for instance, our subconscious runs our autonomic nervous system, hormones, you know, blood sugar levels, all this stuff. So if I go into, you know, a grocery store and I go up to the bakery and I see this cupcake there that looks really, really good, the first thing that I start doing, whether I'm conscious of it or not, is I'm imagining eating this cupcake. The minute that I make that picture in my mind, my subconscious anticipates the rush of sugar, the influx of sugar, and begins lowering my blood sugar automatically, which increases my cravings and makes me want the cupcake even more. So there's that type of biological component that, uh, that, uh, you know, that we deal with that we can use the subconscious mind to regulate. Another important component of it is that cravings are often neuroassociative. You know, meaning that, you know, what's called Hebb's Law, neurons that fire together, wire together. So we'll have cravings when we're in a particular environment or a particular time of day. You know, for myself, one of the things I had to deal with was any time that I sit down in front of the TV, it was cravings to you know, eat anything. Because I'd wire those neurons together, the neurons that said eat, and the ones that watch TV together. So part of the process is beginning to uncouple those, those things. Um, and, you know, then also part of the process as well is that we tend to have a very short-term, if we look at NLP, neurolinguistic programming, cravings are a very short-term strategy, feel-good strategy. We never go beyond the part where we feel bad. 
you know, we're after we eat the thing. We don't think about that until afterwards, at least not in an emotional way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is learning how to pull that in so we get the whole picture. And then on an emotional level, and then a lot of times that will end up diffusing the cravings. Awesome. You know, I've never in this series heard it explained like that, and I love it. You know, people oh, talk. Yeah, people talked about it differently, and I knew yours would be different. So awesome. he's whispering in my ear the whole time. Oh, he's telling he's the you. The, he's he's the brain behind this operation. <laughs> yeah, you're pinky, and he's the brain, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, this has really been very delightful, and I'm really grateful well, that you that you are on with us. Thank you so much, and everybody's just going to love this. I know I did. So oh, I enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us. It was wonderful. Thank you for having me. And thank you all. We'll see you in another episode. Bye.